I'm going to start with a with a prayer that's a part of the rite of chrismation. <clears throat> Let us pray. I think this fits for what we're talking about. Confirm, O Lord, what thou hast wrought in us from the holy temple which is in Jerusalem. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Confirm, O Lord, what thou hast wrought in us from thy holy temple, which is in Jerusalem. You can see how that would fit this when we talk about priesthood, and the priesthood of all of us, and everything we've been talking about in the last several months is all in the context of creation. And remember that the temple was a reflection of paradise, or was supposed to be. So the priesthood is a reflection of of Adam in the beginning in creation, his role and his purpose. In past lessons, we've we've looked at priesthood and we've seen that it's not twofold, it's threefold. The priesthood of Christ, the priesthood of the clergy, the priesthood of the people. We all have a priesthood and we're all part of the priesthood. We all take part in this and we need to learn our place. The ancient temple priesthood was also uh, threefold. Remember, it reflected paradise. So you had the high priest who represented God in creation, the priests themselves who, who did the temple work on earth and represented the people uh, and God on, uh, to the people. And the people themselves who came and, and in many cases made the sacrifices. The people in many instances made the sacrifices and all the priests did would join them in many instances and say the prayers. Uh, and make sure that everything was done properly while the people did it. So how would you like to go, every time you come to Mass, I want you to think of it, how would you like to have to bring a, a goat in or something and cut its throat uh, once a week or once a month or whatever that was? So I wouldn't want to have to stand there with a bowl and collect the blood. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> we, we sort of do that, but that's another story. In any case, uh, a glance at the temple clergy, which we tried to do last week, we sort of did, does two things. One, it illuminates Christ's work as the great high priest. Christ is the great high priest. Uh, God incarnate is the great high priest. And, and looking at the temple illuminates that work. Uh, and that's important. Now, if you want to get some more information on that, read the epistle to the Hebrews, which establishes Christ's high priesthood. And also, it gives us a model for our own priestly work. So understanding the temple priesthood, we sort of saw this last time. Uh, gives us a model for our own priestly work, all of us, all our priestly works. Uh, and if you want to read a couple of Bible books that sort of illuminate that, but you know, not so obviously, you will have to do some research and study, but look at Leviticus and look at Malachi. Uh, Leviticus for what should be done and Malachi for what should not be done <laughs> or what attitudes not to have. And so knowing our model gives us a glimpse of what our work is. You know, we're just not here to show up from time to time and just watch. Uh, we're here to do something. We're here to participate in eternity, to participate in paradise. And so today in that process, we're going to look at an example because the, the pre, if the priesthood of the temple tells us something, and if the priesthood itself tells us something about our ministry, uh, then looking at an example of a priest can tell us something about what our work is. So we're going to look at the life of St. John of Kronstadt. St. John is a 19th century Orthodox uh, priest who has become, because of his humility, uh, the patron saint in Orthodoxy of parish clergy. Uh, so we want to look at him. And he's a, he's a delightful looking man. I wish I had an icon of him here to, to show. But he's a, do we have one over there? I don't see one. Uh, I should have brought one or something. Uh, in any case, he's, he's a great example for us uh, as a role model for the clergy, but also you have to take then what his role model for the clergy is and translate it to, to yourselves. Uh, to, we have to translate it to ourselves, all of us. Uh, so we have this patron saint of the priest. We're going to look at his bio today. Uh, and in the next three or four lessons, we're going to draw from his words things that he says to clergy and says to the people. Uh, and we can translate it from the clergy to the people and glimpse not just what we need to do, but also what our attitudes need to be. So talking about St. John in, in his life, he lived from 1829 to 1908, to give you a perspective, 19th century saint uh, in the Russian church. He was born on the 19th of October uh, in, in, this, in a town called Sura in the province of Arch, Archangel, and Archangelsk. I can't pronounce these Slavic names. Uh, <clears throat> Irish is hard enough to pronounce. Uh, that's in North Russia up near, is it Finland that's closest to Russia? Uh, yeah, and that, it, it, I've just learned recently, I, I didn't know this, 
always thought the Finns were were uh, Germanic like the rest of the Danes and, and the Norwegians, but actually they're Slavic. So Finland has a closer association with Russia than it does with the other uh, Scandinavian countries. In any case, his town of Suras up in that near that area, the very northern part, way north, even of Saint, north of St. Petersburg, he was the son of an Orthodox deacon, so the story goes, or some stories say that his father was a reader and some say that he was a sacristan. Now, if he, if he were a deacon, he had to have been tonsured a reader before he was made a deacon. Uh, and he was probably a sacristan before that. So he could have been easily all three. I don't know. The, I think the most popular story was his father was a deacon. His family was poor. So in his youth, his mother taught him to pray. And he learned well the lessons that she taught him. Uh, I'm sure his father taught him too. But his mother gets all the credit in the story of his bio. As he was growing up, he found that reading was extremely difficult. Uh, <clears throat> did he have a learning disorder? We don't know, but he certainly had problems with trying to read. And his parents wanted him to have an education, so they scratched out the money. Imagine being in poverty and scratching out the money to send your child to a school to get an education. It'd be like trying to scratch up the money to send your child to a, a private school uh, in this day and age. It would be extremely difficult. And he got there in this school where he began to do his studies and started lagging behind because of his learning disability, whatever this problem was. Uh, and it grieved him to no end. And it grieved him for selfless reasons. He sensed that his failure would unduly burden these, his parents who'd worked so hard to send him here. Uh, he said this, and his words are so powerful. I understand the difficult position of my parent and therefore my inability to learn was a real disaster. I did not think much about the significance of learning with respect to my, my future, but I was especially sad about the fact that father was spending his last resources on my upkeep and all in vain. Uh, you imagine you can feel his grief and his sadness. So he began to pray that God would heal his inability to learn easily for his parents' sake. So his prayer is on behalf of his parents really, uh, and he prays for healing, not for selfish reasons, but for selfless reasons. He said, I fell on my knees and began to pray ardently. Uh, and so he did. One morning as he went about preparing for his studies, which he, he dreaded, he found that he could both read easily and understand what he had read. His words say this, it was as if a veil had fallen from my eyes, as if my reason had awakened. Uh, that's why we always say, let this, whatever you learn in orthodoxy, let it germinate and don't jump to any conclusions if you don't get it right away, if you don't get the hang of it. Sometimes it takes time. And as we'll see in one thing about St. John, some of this took 25 years. Well, we're Americans. We like everything yesterday. Uh, so we have a real problem with anything that takes a long time. But this is the way it is. We are now on this, on the the span of eternity. So everything has no end. It goes on and on and on and on. So we're not going to get it necessarily right away. And it doesn't matter. Just, just get it. Just begin to move into it. So in any case, he realized from all of this, the importance of prayer in his life, especially prayer for others, selfless prayer. It's interesting that ultimately he, he graduated at the top of his class in school. Um, I, this is an aside, but I like this guy as a patron saint of priests because many of us feel very insecure when it comes to academic stuff. Uh, and seminary is a good place to find out. You know, you go to you guys go to seminary, they think, ah, oh, I'm such an intellectual type. You know, I'm so I'm so knowledgeable. And we get there, and we find ourselves uh, in the big in the real school now. Uh, and there are a bunch of other people there that are just as intelligent and maybe even more so. And you start to feel a little bit, you know, I'm not, I'm not so sharp after all. And uh, the more we get exposed to it, the less we for sure of ourselves we feel. Uh, so I'm sure he felt that. And yet he graduated at the top of his class and learned great humility and the discipline of prayer in the, in the, in the process of the discipline of selfless prayer. And that's really one of the things we need to learn. Between 1851 and 1855, he attended seminary. When he graduated from school, the regular school, uh, he immediately was sent to St. Petersburg Theological Academy, which was a seminary. Uh, so he had a four-year seminary period. 
uh, in attempting to decide, in, in going through this process, he had to decide whether he was going to be a priest, a monk, and or a priest or a monk, a secular priest or a monk. Now, when I say a secular priest, that doesn't mean someone who's worldly and, and compromised the faith. In the language of the secular, it means has a ministry in the world. We are secular clergy, uh, and as opposed to monastic clergy who are, who are incorporated in a monastic community and, and cut off from the world. Uh, in orthodoxy, we don't have working orders like are present in the Roman church. We have orders of teachers, teaching nuns and teaching priests and things like that. We don't have that. You're in a monastic community or you're in the world. Uh, and so he had to decide which he was going to be. He also knew that he wanted to be married someday. <laughs> so he wanted to be a married priest, which assures that you were in the world, I assure you. Uh, and so he had to decide when, which, we, which he was going to do. In orthodoxy, in spite of the fact that we're married, married men can, I mean, priests cannot marry. So I know you know this, but priests cannot marry. Married men can be priests. So if you, one has to decide before he's ordained whether he's going to be married. And, and some guys actually, and this is perfectly allowable in orthodoxy, some guys actually uh, go through seminary, graduate from seminary, and then postpone ordination and see, to see a few year, have a few years to see whether they, they might find somebody or meet someone. That's not uncommon. And it's just, it's okay. Uh, and St. John was one of those people who had to make that decision uh, I, I know this is sort of inside, but there's, there's, there's one priest I know that he went through this, and uh, you, you probably know him, but I won't bring up his name since we're uh, out there on the line. Uh, in any case, uh, he, he knew he wanted to be married, so he went to seminary, didn't file his paperwork after he got graduated. He got a job in a parish working as, a, I think he was a youth minister doing something. Uh, and during the time that he was working that job, he met a young lady in the parish and they fell in love. And so they decided to get married. So <laughs> I'm sure he told her this, but uh, in any case, in one month, I think it was one month, he got, they got married, he got ordained, and they got moved to another state. <laughs> Now, you know, they, they say moving and marriage are two of the things that are deadly to any relationship. Uh, just so tra traumatic, uh, cause, trauma causing. Uh, and yet he had all three of these things all at once. So th they're still married many years later. And I'm sure all is well in this because they were well grounded. Uh, St. John knew his measure. And that's the point of this. He knew his measure. He knew that he wanted to be a married priest. Uh, and and that, that pushed him forward. Uh, in, in the Christian life, we need to know, as Father Zacharias says, our measure. We need, and our, knowing our measure, it means this is where we start. It doesn't mean I can't do anything more than this. It means this is where I start. We're in the world. So our measure is to work from that perspective. You are in the world. Your measure is to work from that perspective. Each of you is different. You have different talents and gifts and abilities. It's a starting point. We don't say we stop there and that's all I can do. I can't do any more. We can, by God's grace, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. But that's the starting point where we are. Well, weaknesses, sins, defects, everything. That's our starting point. So he knew his measure. His, when he finally graduated and, and married, uh, he was ordained a, pre, a deacon in 1855 and a priest two days later. So talk about his life changing. His first assignment to a parish was his only assignment. Can you imagine that? He was 53 years in the same church, first serving as under another priest, and then later uh, th that priest retired or died or something, and St. John was elevated to take over the parish. That's rare. Most clergy don't stay in the same place for 53 years. In fact, sometimes it's not a good idea. Uh, in any case, then you have the period of his ministry, which from 1855 to 1908. In going into the parish and in establishing his ministry in the parish, he, he, in, he immediately established a discipline for himself, a spiritual discipline. And that is that he studied and interceded at night. He saw the importance of interceding for the people and constantly studying the faith. I mean, if we're going into a mystery, it's not enough for us to say to you, do this, this and that. It's, we have to do it ourselves. 
We're to lead the way. And this is what is true of us is true for all of us. We all should be leading the way. We're going out into the world and we are priests to the world. And we have to lead the way, and we have to lead the way from our own experience of Christ and of eternity and of paradise. So he learned that he had to do something to keep this process going in his own life. So he studied and interceded at night and then served the people during the day. Now, I'm going to give you a list of some of the things he did in a minute. But you have to understand the first thing he did was after he studied and prayed all night, most of the night, is that he said the... He said the daily offices of the church, his prayer time, and the sources I've read don't, don't suggest whether he did, which offices he did, but in the monastic tradition in both Eastern and Western Rite, there are eight services, daily services. Now, in the Western Rite, in doing the, the ones that we do here, we have, they've, been, they've been reduced to two to make it easier for everybody to do. So he might have done something like that. The Eastern Rite has some versions of that. <clears throat> he might have done something like that. Or he might have done the eight canonical offices. Do you realize what kind of time that takes to do that every day and to deal with the people uh, and to do the things that you're going to see he did? But he established a discipline for himself so that it could be done, so that he could do it. Uh, and, and, you know, we tell ourselves, well, I don't have time for that. <laughs> Years ago, when I was a priest in a, outside of orthodoxy, uh, I got myself in health issues because I kept telling myself whenever I was asked to serve on another committee in the diocese, I thought, oh, I can do one more thing. It's just one more meeting. And one day I got real sick. Uh, and it was because I'd overextended myself. Uh, and you, you have, we have to know our measure and we have to know, we have to work within those limitations. And St. John certainly yeah. learned to do that. He then began, based upon his prayer and his intercession for the people, extensive educational and charitable programs, which were intended to attract people to the truth of orthodoxy. He founded churches and convents to this end. And please understand, most of us, come, most of us who are converts to orthodoxy come into orthodoxy with the understanding of all the ecclesiastical reality based upon the separated West. So if someone says convents, we think of, you know, these homes where the, the monasteries or convents, the homes where the monks and the nuns go, but they go out in the world all the time and they're out there and they're just like anybody else, except they meet every once in a while in the, in the place where they live. But in orthodoxy, a convent or it's a monastery, period, for both male or female. Uh, a monastery is a place where one lives the faith in a very intensified way, more intense than marriage, people. <laughs> so if you know how intense marriage can be, uh, it's much more intense than that. Uh, because really, that's what it takes to draw one into the mystery of God incarnate. Uh, and so he, he started churches and convents so that the people could start there uh, and learn the disciplines of prayer that he had learned and was learning. Out of all of that then, out of that setting and that proper setting, he established workshops, schools, and he's running all these now, orphanages, canteens, which are like small grocery stores, libraries, hospitals, and almshouses. <laughs> Sound like a Lenten discipline. He's doing all of this, and he's finding time to pray at night for everybody. Uh, I... Well, that's another story. So his main devotion uh, was always to prayer because he recognized the importance of it and he made it a priority. Uh, in the 1870s, after about 25 years of this, miracles started to happen. Miracles started to happen 25 years later. Again, we, 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 can't, we can't just say I got to do it and expect to have things, to happen, things to happen right away. Uh, we have to understand that it might take time. We have to apply ourselves to that time. This spread his reputation. In fact, he was considered a saint by many, at least popularly, uh, long before his death, which is not usually the case. He kept a daily journal. So in the context of all that, he had time to sit down every night and write what was going on in his life. And it's been produced in this book called My Life in Christ. Look how thick that is. I think it's, what, four, 500 pages of his notes, easily read and understood. There is also 
a, a fellow named Jardine or Gris, Jardine Gris book who has written taken two volumes of his uh, his material uh, created two small volumes. These are real. These two once called councils on the Christian priesthood and the other one is spiritual councils of St. John of Kronstadt. You can get them from St. Vlad's and and they're very readable. And, and I recommend this, this too, but this especially. In fact, what we're going to do in the next four lessons is draw from what uh, Grisbrook has done with this material uh, in this little booklet. Uh, in any case, he he died in 1908 after all of that was canonized by the Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia in 1964. And as I recall, the, the, the Moscow Patriarchate also uh, canonized him in like something like 1991, I believe it was. Uh, he practiced his priesthood uh, representing all of his people and was as in the temple uh, priesthood and also Adam in the Garden of Eden. He was an intermediary between God and the people and the people of God. And he strove constantly to be holy because he understood, much like you were alluding to in the sermon, uh, that all of creation is affected by our, our righteousness or our sin. And so he strove, like the ancient temple priesthood, to have a holy life so that that relationship was not in, violated, nothing interfered with it, that, that the flow of grace from God through him to creation continued and, and to teach it to the people so that they could do the same. His understanding of prayer uh, was that he realized its ability to transform circumstances. I'm very grateful to you for the fact that you teach everybody and you emphasize in this parish the importance of prayer. This is our work. Uh, he made it a priority and he taught his people to make it a priority. No wonder they, they adored him. Uh, he performed it repeatedly throughout each day in his own discipline. Everything he did was in this context. So for us, everything we do and, and, and we are and, and we become are in the context of our lives here uh, in prayer, in devotion to Christ, our lives as priests of creation. This was his priestly ministry, his priestly work. And you can see what an example, I read St. John and I'm encouraged, not just as a priest, a clergy, but, but because this is something that any Christian can do. Um, and, and, and he encourages us to do it. And he probably would have very humbly said, you know, I'm, I'm nobody. <laughs> uh, he just seemed to be that kind of person. Uh, notice, notice in orthodoxy, I love it, that the great saints will, will downplay their, their own abilities. Father Zacharias, who's such a marvel, says, I'm stupid. <laughs> wait a minute, are you talking about me? Uh, so in any case. Uh, the next time we'll use some of the material out of here out of this book and we'll talk about the priest person, what St. John says, and, it, and again, it's translatable to all of us, the priest person. We need to understand something about our characters and the kind of people we are and how this plays into this role. Uh, and, and so we're going to work that uh, next time. I don't Questions? the name of the book again? Uh, councils on the Christian Priesthood or the Spiritual Councils of St. John of Kronstadt. They're two different books about this thick. And he's, it's large print, guys. <laughs> so, <laughs> just, so nobody has to be intimidated. <laughs> so, you know, if I hold up something like this, you go, oh, I don't know. I don't know. But something like this cuts it all down to where we can all deal with it anyway. Thank this, you. This is a good point in this in the series at this juncture. You're, you've just learned a little bit of the life of this blessed priest. I want to encourage you as we're moving ahead with everything Father's going to offer about his life. What we're going to see is what the life of the Christian ought to be. And we wouldn't be talking about it or showing it if it were not absolutely attainable in our lives. Sometimes we think of a saint in all of their disciplines and everything that they do. I'm, they struggled through their humanity no different than we do to get to those disciplines. And no, it doesn't mean we necessarily have to be up all night <laughs> in order to accomplish all these things. God bends time when we bend to him. OK, what I want you to see is this. If you you many of you will remember. 
when Bishop John, John visited, I like to go back to this because he says such an incredible truth. Bishop John visited, I think this was three or four years ago when he had come to us. It wasn't his most recent visit. I remember he got up and when he was preaching, the first thing out of his mouth was something we all chuckled at. He said, Father Mark does not work for a living. <laughs> and we all laughed. And I'm sitting there going, where are you going with this? Because I know what I'm doing. <laughs> I know I can do it better, but I'm working here. <laughs> but, and we'd had coffee that day. He'd already shared a little bit about this. So I knew where he was going. But he, then he said this. He said that this parish, as well as many parishes, are blessed to afford a priest the opportunity to not have to work, but to demonstrate how we all should live. In the way that the priest lives among you and the way that the priest lives in the world, the secular priesthood, is us, all of us. And then he went on to say, you know, when somebody is sick, Father Mark is at the hospital, either anointing them or bringing them Eucharist or going to be with them. When someone is homebound, when someone is struggling, and he went on and on. He said, you know why Father Mark is to do those things? So that he becomes not the only one that's doing those things. <laughs> so that when one of you is sick, you go to the hospital and bless them with presents and pray for them and read them the Psalms. You see? Everything that we're going to hear moving forward about our vocation as the priesthood through the heart of, of <laughs> St. John is going to show us how we live as Christians in the most practical ways. Yes, there are things we must attain to, grow into, but do not see them ever or anything else a saint brings to the table through their own life. If we see it as unattainable, we don't believe in Christianity. They're saints because they gave in to the Holy Spirit, the seed of God within them, and they blossom to the life of Christ. And they lived among us as we should live among one another. That's a big part of the priesthood in our calling. So I just, this is a good juncture, hearing his life, but also hearing where we're going to move forward. These are things we must walk in. We're about to get on the job training. How about that? Father, anything else? Nope, that's it. Good summary. Thank you. God bless you all. Two weeks. <laughs>